Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm very happy to introduce you to Omar Alonso. He is uh, going to present an introduction to domain-specific knowledge graphs construction. As I already told you, I already presented you to, to the class, but he is now working for Instacart, California, United States of America, and he has a very long experience in uh, industry, uh, I guess, started from Oracle, then Microsoft, then maybe he's going to tell you other places for a long time. With so very long experience in many different fields connected to information retrieval and databases and everything in between. So uh, I think this is a very valuable lecture to all of you, a series of lectures actually, because. Omar is going to present tomorrow what he can conclude today. Or, um, and there is a lot of stuff, very interesting. So stay focused, have questions. I think you can ask questions while he's presenting or right afterwards. Or you know that on uh, uh, in the afternoon, you can book a slot. Maybe you want to discuss ideas with both of us, only with Omar. Uh, for 15, 20 minutes, so uh, use that possibility. I sent you an email with all the details about that, okay? Uh, there are still empty slots, so if you want that, if you have problems because you have other lectures, so it's overlapping, just drop an email, we find an alternative, okay? If you want to do that. And I think that's it. Okay, I give you the, let me just see. This works perfect. Thank you, Gianmaria, for the uh, introduction. And uh, it's great to be back in, in Italy. I do enjoy being here a lot. So today, I'm going to give you an introduction to knowledge graphs. And um, we'll have more topics for tomorrow. A bit of a disclaimer uh, here. It's basically that this is just, uh, you know, Personal views on, on knowledge graph doesn't represent what I did at Microsoft, uh, at another startup, and also at my current employer, which is basically Instacart. Now, the outline for today and tomorrow is going to be the following. We'll be covering basically some key concepts. I'm pretty sure that some of those things are already covered in the class or maybe in other lectures. So apologize in advance if you already know these things, but just to set up the context, I'm not going to describe some of them. The second is, we'll be talking about uh, what does it mean to build the knowledge graph and how to represent some of these things. And we'll be getting into knowledge graphs for information retrieval. Um, today, we'll probably do one example. Tomorrow, we'll do three more examples. And then we're going to finish with design considerations if you want to build a knowledge graph. And then at the end, I'll have a conclusion. And then I'm going to have a couple of slides with a bunch of different pointers, in particular to uh, books and papers that you might want to take a look and read in more detail. And feel free to ask me any question during the lecture or afterwards or tomorrow. I'm here until uh, Friday. All right, so the first part is very introduction and, and main concepts. The reason why I want to have this is because there's a lot of buzzwording about knowledge graph and lots of terminology and lots of, you know, buzzwords and, you know, OWL and ontologies and Node4j and Neo4j and Sparkle and Neptune, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll try to keep it like as plain as possible in English. So the, the understanding or definition of this graph is basically you want to, and we want to describe objects of interest and connections. Very, very simple definition uh, is to organize data as nodes and edges. If you have taken an algorithms class, which is basically you represent, you know, a, a node and an edge, and then you use Dijkstra to, to graph. Here is something similar. We're not going to use Dijkstra, but the idea is to represent data in terms of nodes and edges. There are been many, many graphs uh, in industry, in particular, uh, Microsoft Satori. I used to work at Microsoft. Uh, this is a uh, source from uh, Wikipedia and the web. 
uh, Google Knowledge Graph. Also, the Google guys have this massive knowledge graph, and we'll show you how it works or how it is being used in production. Amazon started a project to build a very specific graph. It's a vertical for products only. And this has been a project going on for about five years. This is just industry. Uh, and then in academia, you have things like Iago, which is uh, Max Planck, uh, source from Wikipedia. Um, and it's available on the web if you want to use the data and also uh, play with the system. And you have Freebase, who used to be uh, a startup that was acquired by Google, uh, based also on kind of human computation for creating uh, uh, knowledge. There's also a little bit of uh, confusion in terms of the terminology. Some people talk about knowledge graphs, some people talk about knowledge bases, but for the rest of, of the lecture, let's just assume they're basically the same thing uh, in, in our case. Second part of the uh, terminology is uh, we want to identify nodes and derive edges. And so far, most of the work on knowledge graph or knowledge bases are been using Wikipedia as a source. So all of us are familiar with Wikipedia. And the idea here is if we have Wikipedia, then we can use the data from Wikipedia to build it. And that is phenomenal. Uh, but also problematic because it only works for certain domains and not for others. So the benefits in Wikipedia is easy to read. All of us know how to read the Wikipedia page. All of us know how to read wiki. You know, it's very easy to parse and read. You know where to find things. Um, then Wikipedians, basically the people who are behind, you know, writing those pages. Uh, it's a small set of people, but they are very active. And, in the case of major events like you know, the World Cup or a US election, all that information is going to be updated uh, at any second. However, for things that are not so popular, there's quite a bit of you know, stuff that is out of date. So not always you know, the best resource. And also biases, right? Because this is a very small set of people working on those pages and you know, it, may, it may have biases. So the problem is, what do we do when there's no Wikipedia? So how can we build a knowledge graph when there's no Wikipedia? And believe me, there's plenty of examples in the world that there's no information on Wikipedia or the information that you have on Wikipedia is kind of rather small. So we're going to be discussing techniques if you want to do that. Getting into more specific definitions, you know, knowledge graph is basically a repository of entities types and relationships. You can also define a knowledge graph as you know, uh, a way of defining entities, types, attributes, relations, provenance. But this is probably the most important definition is number three. A knowledge graph is just data. That's it, plain and simple. Okay, it's data is not gonna solve all your problems. It's not gonna uh, hope uh, to, to fix your relevance problems in a search engine or whatever problems you may have on a database or application. It's just data. Um, because it's data, you as a developer or owner of a particular application, you need to use this data whatever you want. But per se, on itself, the knowledge graph is not solving you a specific problem. Um, a knowledge graph also evolves over time. I was talking about the U.S. elections. You know, there was going to be there was a new president, and there's going to be a new president in four years or eight years. There's always, you know, the World Cup every four years. A new champion. There's a new team. There's new players. So these things uh, do evolve, and you need to maintain them. Okay, so these are not something that you just create and you say we're done. That's it. You know, for the exceptions like you know, Padua, it's, it's a city in Italy, unlikely that's going to be, you know, moved to another country, which those things are stable. The rest, there's a lot of things that are not stable. We're going to see tomorrow an example of a product graph where, you know, brands and products do evolve a lot. Like Adidas and Nike are unlikely to go out of business, but the kind of products they build and sell is going to change over time. What is the difference of between a knowledge graph and a database. So this is also a very common uh, question. So we can think of, uh, by the way, this is just my you know, 
interpretation of the differences. Uh, you, we can think of a database, basically, uh, it's, it's an engine that is gonna store data for a specific application purpose, right? Because we build a database because we have to support an application. Here in the university, you may have, I'm, not, I'm sure you have, a database that will store, uh, store all your, you know, uh, classes and all the grades that you get, you know, and the reason why there's such database is because, you know, at the end of the day, what you want is after a few years, you wanna get a degree, right? So that's the application. Now, the semantics of, of this uh, uh, database are very well understood by you because you're a student and then by Jean Maria because he's a professor and you know the, the admin people of the university who are gonna grant the degree. And it's mostly about tables, columns, attributes, keys, etc. Now, a knowledge graph, in contrast, is basically a slice of the world, a piece of the world. Like, you know, what do we understand about the world? Uh, these semantics are usually understood very well and they're all agreed upon by all the stakeholders, meaning like people who are involved in the creation of the graph, but also in the usage of the graph. Um, these are the two main things. It is application independent. Okay, so you don't build a graph a knowledge graph because you want to you know, build a changing, or you don't build a graph because you want to clean a data catalog, or you don't build a graph because you want to build a new user interface. Sorry, a knowledge graph, right? So you build a knowledge graph because you believe it's a new data asset that can be helpful for your team, organization, company, etc. And then you can build applications on top of the graph. Now that is kind of key, it's application independent. There are problems if you make it application dependent because it's not gonna scale and it's not gonna work for other applications, that's what you want. And then I stole this um, phrase from Amit Singhal who used to be at Google uh, when, when they launched the Google Knowledge Graph, there's a nice page and actually you can just Google this, you know, things, not strings. That's basically kind of a good definition of a knowledge graph, right? And what do I mean and what do we mean by this when we say, Padua, we mean city in Italy. We don't mean, you know, the string Padua that, you know, starts with a P uppercase and so forth. So you want like semantics around that. Why we care, we say, okay, why another thing? Why we have a database? Why we want to build this? The reason why we care is because if there's a way that we can store machine-readable data about things, uh, about a domain, then we can use this for many applications, artificial intelligence, machine learning, information retrieval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of benefits if we can build these things. It's also drawbacks if you don't have this knowledge graph, some things get more difficult to do. If you have the knowledge graph, a lot of the things that you want to do are possible. And the reason I'm saying this is because the data we use for different use cases, and we'll see uh, some examples in today's lecture. And the, the last piece is the notion of separation of concerns. Separation of concerns, it's a, it's a term from software engineering. When you're building a system and you want to have boundaries between components of you know a large-scale system if we have an if you build a knowledge graph then you can have a lot of interesting separation of concerns data who owns the data who produces the data and who is consuming the data that's another um, way of why you want to have this in your team or organization knowledge graphs in action uh, one of the most popular applications of knowledge graph is to you know help on Semantic search. Semantic search, e.g., going beyond 10 blue links. So 10 blue links is basically whatever you get in Google. Okay, you issue the query, you know, Padova, Italy, and you get 10 blue links. And it's called 10 blue links because they've been 10 since the first day of the web. Those links have been blue. Okay, and that the, the user interface hasn't changed that much, although there's, there's obviously uh, new things coming. In general, the, the look and feel of the page is still very, very spartan. 
So what you want is, uh, uh, how, can we, um, how can we go uh, to better things than just showing Tableau links? The second part is, can we understand queries and documents better? So if I issue the query bad, uh, I just don't want to parse, you know, okay, it's P-A-D-U-A, -A. Uh, can I get something more? And if I can get something more, which is understand the semantics of the query and then understand the semantics of the documents. Question answering is the second, you know, very popular application. And if you want is you want to ask the question to the engine, you can ask, you know, you can just ask to Siri or Alexa or Google and say, you know, how long is it going to take to take the train from Padua to Venice, uh, to Venice. And you want just an answer, you know, half an hour, you know, 35 minutes, you want just uh, an answer. Language understanding, similarly, can I, can, can I help me understand what you're talking about? Um, this kind of a data cleaning um, application, which seems like boring, but it's extremely you know, problematic in the real world if you're dealing with massive, say, catalogs or places that maybe they're you know, a little bit old. Some of the things are gonna be a little bit uh, not clean in terms of data. Like, for example, Padua may be a uh, spell or you know, it was, you know there's a typo and what you want is if you have a knowledge graph this can be very useful for cleaning automatically my data which is actually very very powerful I'm gonna give you a few examples of the uh, how Bing and, and uh, Google are using their respective knowledge graphs for for search the first one is the famous complete which I'm pretty sure you really know how it works but here's a little bit of a caveat so if I start this is Bing uh, Microsoft Bing Google um, and by the way these are done from the US so I'm not quite sure if the, the semantics or the behavior is the same in, in, in Italy here but let's assume they are you start with S A U E and gonna say I think I think you're trying to get into Starcraft and uh, I'm just gonna tell you that I understand this is a food type. Uh, I'm just giving you, just in case, an image. And then the rest of the, uh, of the other component, right? Uh, Google is doing the same, but actually gets uh, faster. So it's just only three characters, S-A-U, um, it's means StarCraft. Then it's like, maybe you meant sauce. Or uh, hey, maybe you know, you're looking for saute mushrooms. Um, as you can see, you know, sauce. Very, 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 very food oriented, but you get the idea, right? So, and these are things, not strings, because these are like three things. This is only strings. You know, these are, you know, three entities, four entities. This is one entity. The other application of the knowledge graph is uh, entity cards, sometimes called information boxes, depending or answers, depending on the search engine, but for Things that are well understood, if I issue the query, this I believe is uh, Microsoft, and this is Google. I, um, if you issue the query pesto, right, and it's pretty clear that you mean they you know the pesto sauce, so, or the, or something about that. So, you know, three or four images, uh, a little bit of a definition here telling you that it's coming from Wikipedia. Place of origin, this is from Italy, main ingredient, alternative names. And below the card, you'll see this kind of related stuff. Like, you know, this type of sauce goes with this uh, piece, you know, kind of pasta. And just in case people were looking for, you know, either related type of sauce uh, or um, recipes. Why they care to do this? Just to preempt what you're trying to do. Okay, maybe you're looking for a pesto recipe, maybe you're looking for you know, pesto and penne pasta, maybe you're for an alternative to pesto. All these things are kind of already pre-computed here. So when you reach on the query pesto, you have this, the search results on the left and on the right side, you have the entity card, which is a summary of like, everything you need to know about pesto is there. Pretty, pretty useful. This is the example I believe from either Google or Bing, I forgot, but it's again, same idea, you know, slightly different images. Uh, also from Wikipedia, uh, the main ingredients, 
and, and then people who search for pesto also search for these other things. Very useful. Why you think this is useful? Because it's saving you time. Okay, so if you're looking for like a pesto alternative, you know, you start with pesto to see what the engine gives you, and uh, you can just navigate those links, and this is a, a good summary. One comment though, that this thing doesn't fire, basically when I say fire, it's like, you know, shows the results every time you issue the query for every query. So you can type anything on, on, on Google or Bing, for a percentage of those queries, you'll see these entity cards, not for all of them. Why? Because those are powered by uh, a knowledge graph under the covers, and they will only show the results when the engine is pretty sure that you want this. And we'll be talking about this uh, tomorrow. And finally, answers. So here is, uh, this is Google, and this is Microsoft. Uh, the question is, does tiramisu have alcohol? And then what you want is basically the answer yes or no. So uh, an image of a tiramisu and then, you know, kind of an explanation of yes or no, the same here. Under the covers, it's using the same knowledge graph to help you, you know, either answer this particular query or, you know, give you relevant results. And I apologize if you already know this, um, but I wanted to give you a context of why this type of information might be useful. All right, so I mentioned many things, so we're gonna you know, go into this, this uh, uh, item in more detail. The first one is the notion of an entity. Entity is basically an object or concept in the real world that um, can be identified, like for example, you know, Padua can be identified, you know, Microsoft, you know, Google, that, that can be considered to be uh, an entity. Uh, uniquely uh, characterized by its name, type, attributes, and relationship to other entities. You also have the notion of a name entity. So you have an entity, they have a name entity, and this is a specific entity for which uh, one or more designators or proper names can be used to refer to it. Examples could be, for example, Instacart, the, like, the company that I work for. So Instacart is an organization, so the type. Then California, it's a location. Uh, February is a date, all right? So entity, 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 but this is organization, this is location, and this is date. So if you have taken the NLP class, uh, these are types. Um, types are mostly people, organizations, date, numbers, etc. They also have, and you should have, basically a unique identifier. You need, we need to identify these entities as, as precise as possible. And we'll, we'll be talking later why, because we're going to do a little linkage on these things. So we want to make sure that there's a, a proper ID that uniquely identifies, you know, California state, not California as a song. So that'll be another entity or California as, you know, for example, a name of, of, of a person if they happen to have the name California. Types. Entities must uh, maybe categorize into multiple types. I can already say that. Um, types can also be uh, you know, thought as a, as a containers or that, that group entities together with the same properties like people, organizations, that kind of thing. Then you may see this term like looks very complicated ontology. What is an ontology? It's basically a process of describing the kind of properties or relationships, sorry, I like to move, um, between the things that will be uh, described from the real world. And when people build ontologies, they usually use logic to formalize this description. We'll see later that in certain cases, you want to have an ontology, for example, medicine. In other cases, maybe you don't need an ontology. Think of, a, of an ontology as a schema. So if you're taking the database class, Ontology is basically a schema, right? And, and then you may also heard this term called taxonomies, which is basically a hierarchical organization of things. Um, taxonomy is basically a directed acyclic graph where the nodes and classes, and there's an edge from class X to, to Y. 
but again, taxonomies, ontologies, schemas, it's just like terminology that you're going to use to define the representation of, of your um, knowledge graph. Names, we have multiple entities that may share the same name. An example could be Georgia, Georgia the country, but also it's the name of, of a person. It could also be the name of a song, all right? And so this is gonna be complicated because we need to identify you know, Georgia properly. And we're gonna use in, in certain cases, you know, extra information to identify what Georgia we're talking about. Attributes, these are you know, standard as well as relationships. It's gonna describe how two entities are associated together. For example, Bill Gates, you know, found of Microsoft, Bill Gates, uh, entity, uh, person, Microsoft entity company relationship found okay, Bill Gates co-founder of Microsoft. Furthermore, we'll see later that uh, you know Bill Gates' name, hopefully his real you know official name is William Gates the third. And then you have to also identify that when we say Bill Gates, actually means William Gates. Why we care about this? Because once we identify uh, entities and relationships and so forth, we're going to use uh, a notation like this one: subject, predicate, and object. In this case, relationships and attributes to kind of standardize what we mean. So I was telling you that you know Bill Gates co-founded Microsoft. I don't have it here, but we'll, this will be another example of other things you may not know. Tom Brady. He's a famous quarterback who plays uh, you know, American football. You know, Tom Brady was born in San Mateo. He was born his place of birth uh, because you know, there are many ways of saying that a person was born in a particular place. So we're gonna just standardize the place of birth. Uh, you know, Tom Brady plays for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with, uh, it's basically the name of the team, but you know, he's a member of a particular sports team. And his occupation, he's an American football player. That's just for names, but uh, since we're in Italy, here's examples of food, right? So fettuccine is a subclass of pasta. Uh, Fusilli is an, another subclass of pasta. Same with linguine. Uh, paella, country of origin in Spain. Paella has chicken, paella has rice, and so forth. So we can use this type of notation, SPOs, which are very famous because if you do this, then you can use you know, RDF, and then we can store triples in any of your favorite databases. You know, of, uh, store knowledge, right? So when we started the lecture, I was saying that KG is just basically data. Uh, think of this as like ground truth. This is already you know, data that we can use, right? Because we can say, hey, uh, what kind of pasta types we have? And we can answer this question, we can say, is uh, fettuccine a pasta? We can say yes, right? Is uh, fusilli a chicken? We can say absolutely not. So you can see the kind of uh, you know queries that we can use if we uh, happen to store this properly. Now there are many ways of storing uh, uh, knowledge graphs, in particular data models. Uh, one of them is called direct edge label graphs. Uh, this is very popular in RDF, Restore, uh, Resource Description Framework, is an example of such a thing. Uh, a graph data set, which is a, a set of uh, name graphs, uh, and each name graph uh, is a pair. It's basically you have a graph ID, and, a, and then you kind of put all these things together. And another alternative is to use property graphs. Uh, property graphs allows a set of uh, property value pairs, um, and then we're going to use a, a label to be associated with specific nodes and edges, and this is also very common in graph databases. Which one is better? Well, it depends on your domain. You know, can, can, can we you know, move data from one to another representation? Absolutely yes, not a problem. And there's many surveys on for, for uh, which specific scenarios you will need one particular data model. But in general, just for all the, with your knowledge, it's, like it's just a data model, okay? How we access uh, knowledge graphs? Uh, so one is the kind of the, the raw querying the first one is you can use Sparkle. So Sparkle is kind of the SQL-like SQL -like equivalent to uh, 
uh, for example, a triple store, or we can use traditional SQL, and instead of uh, storing you know, the triples, we can store information in you know, tables and columns. That's totally doable. It's more complicated to maintain, but you can still do that. You can just raw data in plain text because it's raw data in plain text, but if you have large data sets of millions of triples, it's going to be you know, un completely unmanageable. And if you want to use this in production, you probably are not likely to query your original graph database via Sparkle. We're going to materialize the data in slices. That's the focus of tomorrow, how to do that. And also the focus for tomorrow will be, this is all great, but like millions of triples, it's a pain in the butt to actually you know, browse and search. What can I do? And you're going to basically build your own search and browse user interface. Um, and you may say, hey, but you know, I have this great thing called you know, D3 for visualizing the data, and I'm gonna say, yes, you're gonna get the blue screen of death, because you have millions of, of nodes, and then you put the graph and everything is blue. It's completely unmanageable. All right, so far, mostly talking about the backends. Now let's talk about information needs. So if you're paying attention to the information retrieval class, remember that we always have an information need. I want to see how, how long it's going to take me to get to Venice. And then I have to basically, from that information need, write that into a query. And from that query, I'm going to execute into my favorite search engine. I get the results back. If I'm happy, I'm done. If I'm not happy, I rewrite the query. So the trick, here, the trick here is I have an information need, which is, hey, I need this information because Venice, unlikely that I'm going to drive exactly that massive query, so I'm going to rewrite to just two, two keywords, and I hope I'm going to cross the fingers that Google is going to get what I want in two keywords, and that's my, my uh, result. And if I don't like it, I'm going to rewrite the query. All right, so the first one is basically keyword queries. Uh, free text, just type whatever you want in the box, and hopefully you get what you want to get back. That's one way of issuing information in the is structured queries. Only if you really know the structure, SQL or Sparkle is the way to access the graph. Let's take a look at uh, the third category, which is Keyword++. Plus plus. And Keyword++ plus plus here is queries with filters. So if you're buy, we're buying stuff in Amazon, you know, maybe you were looking for a smartphone, that is less than uh, you know, 200 euros uh, that I can replace you know, in the next two years. So iPhone or smartphone and then have these extra filters. If you're looking for um, you know, something in Netflix or, or uh, uh, IMDb where you're looking to watch a movie and it's like I'm looking, I would like to for buy a movie on, for example, drama, that has been in Europe, uh, we know I learned to learn Italian, so if it's in, in Italy, that would be awesome. So those are, so I have my query, but then I have a lot of filters. Um, obviously, it's called Keyword++ plus plus because at the engine, the engine doesn't care if you have a, a user interface with filters. Filters mean like, you know, different menus with options. Uh, you just get that from the form, and you have the query, and then you just attach all those different filters, and that is the query that it gets executed. Uh, natural language will be that you're going to basically ask Alexa to play you uh, play me a song by Adriano Celentano. Okay, see, I know some Italian. And uh, so the Alexa needs to understand that, you know, it's a singer and song means something about, you know, soundtrack and hopefully the action is that just, you know, I don't want a list of songs, just play me, I said, play me a song. And the last one, which is super popular, in case you, have n you don't know, is zero queries, which I like to call it, you are the query. Every time you fire Facebook, you are the query, because Facebook knows who are you, what's your profile, what you like last yesterday, what did you click on it, what you didn't click on it. Same with Instagram. Okay, those things are basically, it's all driven by profiles. So you are just a document that is matched to a stream of things that is coming in the engine, and that's how you get your results back. Did you all know about this by any chance? 
Yes, this is all familiar. Okay, awesome. So I'll we'll go faster. Yeah. Um, so the, the first one was just introduction of the context, so you know what we're talking about. The second is, okay, uh, I kind of buy the concept. Looks like this is uh, interesting. How we build it. All right, so how, how we build uh, a knowledge graph. The first one is, uh, what's the inputs? Which kind of data are we looking at? So we may have, for example, Wikipedia, which I already mentioned is extremely good. Now, Wikipedia is extremely good for things that are ahead. So I told Jean Maria I wasn't going to use the, uh, the blackboard, but if you think in terms of the distribution of queries, and if we look at you know this famous long tail, this is the head, this is the torso of the distribution, and this is the tail. Okay, this is the head, the torso, and the tail. Extremely super popular. So you know Facebook, you know Google, um, you know Juventus versus Milan are going to be here. This is torso. You know there's frequency. There's frequency. And this is tail, like, you know, one or a couple of frequency, frequent queries every, you know, two months and so forth. So that is, that is very good. And that's from, from, from a perspective of a query log. But if you look at Wikipedia as well, you have, for example, uh, you know, the Wikipedia page of Donald Trump or Joe Biden, super head because he's, he's looking for information about those uh, two uh, persons completely up to date with the latest of the latest. Then you have torso entity, which are updated, but you know, missing information. And then you have tail pages that they just have stopped. It's like, needs an update. And there are pages in Wikipedia that will have this, you know, needs an update, or, or maybe you don't even have a page. So moving away from politics, think in terms of, you know, music, like you have, super popular bands, like, you know, classics, like, you know, the Beatles and Zeppelin, they will have maybe on the head. Then, you know, maybe, you know, a, a famous player will be playing with them. There's an entry, but then when you want to have the page for that player, nowhere to be found. Okay, that's a problem with Wikipedia. So that's Wikipedia as an input source, which is good. The second is catalogs. So a catalog here would be, for example, uh, Walmart has catalogs of all the products, the same with uh, Amazon uh, or Pam. I went to the supermarket a couple of, couple of days ago here in Italy and uh, you know, pretty nice place. And that probably has a catalog, which is basically, you know, there's prosciutto and there's a brand of prosciutto and what's the price and so forth. And that has a description, right? So that is a catalog and assuming those those catalogs are coming from well-known uh, entities. In this case, you know, well-known company. They're going to be useful. They will be noisy, but they're going to be useful. So that's a good source. The third one will be web pages. So the web, you know, plenty of cool information. Go and crawl, you know, the uh, University of Pilot, uh, uh website, and it's going to be pretty good pages. It's going to be, you know, noisy pages, but in general, they're going to be very good. And another, you know, source of of cool data are basically the query logs. So the query logs, which is basically everything that you enter on the search box in Google or Bing or Instagram or Facebook gets stored in something called the query logs. And in the query logs, I'm assuming you covered this topic on the, on the, on the previous lecture, query logs not only just stores the query, stores a lot more information, stores the IP, what time you issue the query, and in the case of certain properties, they will actually store basically your mouse movements, okay? Because for example, if you issue the query, let's say, you know, Milan versus Juve, um, there's an indication that the mouse is gonna be kind of close to where the scroll bar is. So if you're like, you know, the scroll bar is up, that means like you're satisfied with the first or second result. But if you scroll down, then your, move, your, your mouse is gonna be also moving down, meaning like maybe you're looking at the bottom of the page. All that information is stored. Okay, so the, the, 
query logs, basically it's not just your query, it's an incredible amount of behavioral data where you know, all these companies will basically mine those logs to actually get a lot of insight. That's how they target the ads, that's why they know, they know which, one, uh, which queries are trending, that's how they know that this particular tag is related to this thing and so forth, right? So that is all query logs. The problem is you guys don't have access to the query logs. Okay, so if you work for Google, you have. If you work for Microsoft, you do have. But if you don't work for any of those guys, you don't have access to the query logs. Plus, the number of searches are kind of rather small, you know, and there's a, uh, a correlation between uh, search engines and also the main powers of the world, right? So you have, uh, you actually have two main search engines, Google and, and um, Bing in English. Then you have uh, Yandex, Russian, and you have Baidu in Chinese. That's pretty much it. You know, the rest are all kind of verticals. But, you know, English, you know, Russian and Chinese, uh, that's the power of, of, the, of the planet today. You have to also understand, uh, if we can understand which of these sources are more or less authoritative than others. Because we, we don't have the time nor the bandwidth to basically ingest, index, crawl, everything. So then it's important to kind of prioritize the sources. Which are the sources that are more important? Which are the ones that are less important? And way, one way to do that is to understand things that are of high authority. So let's say that you know we want to build an autograph of a politics. Well, probably the Washington Post will be at the top of our list because it's extremely super, you know, authoritative in terms of politics. Right? Versus Omar.com, which like maybe I have a page about politics, but it's completely irrelevant in this scenario. So that is authoritative content. The second is coverage. You want sources or domains or data or data that has a wide coverage. So if our goal is to build a catalog about, for example, Italian food, and looks like, you know, Pam is you know, a great supermarket because it has a wide coverage in terms of products, that could be a good source. If not, then it's not gonna be a good source. Uh, clean representation here mean like the data has to be clean or close to be as clean as possible because we don't wanna deal with noise. It's going to hurt us a lot if you want to build uh, our graph. This is all, you know, very, very good. And in general, you know, it's reasonable. Build, building domain-specific knowledge graph, you want specific information for your domain. So say that, you know, all of us here, we're deciding that, you know, you know build a startup that is going to compete with Spotify. We're going to build a knowledge graph for, you know, bands and music and that kind of stuff. So the first question is, where are we going to get the data? You know, we have to identify that, you know, Led Zeppelin is a rock band that, you know, plays, you know, has four players, one is dead. Uh, where is that information going to come from? If we don't have that, then, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult to build uh, a good knowledge graph. If we can tap into some sort of pre-existing categorization, there's something already out there that we can use, then that is going to be useful. So if in our little project, building a knowledge graph about music, if someone says, hey, you know, I happen to have a friend who works at the EMI and I can get a dump of, you know, the, all the musicians and bands and so forth with some categories that, you know, this is, you know, rock, classic, jazz, that's pretty useful. We can use that. And this is potentially useful. And the reason I'm saying potentially useful is because all these different organizations are going to have different ways of categories. So if you look at it, you say, this looks pretty good. So we go to PAM for our uh, you know, shopping uh, knowledge graph here in Italy. It looks pretty good. Um, I don't know of a different uh, supermarket in Italy. But let's say that we get you know, Carrefour, which is French. And they say it's pretty good, but the classification is slightly different. Right? And then Walmart is like, also slightly different. So then we are in this position where it's like, all of us are giving us some sort of categorization but then these things are not aligned. So then I have to spend work just aligning. So when I were talking about meat, uh, actually meat for all of them or slightly different type of meats and so forth. How do we discover entities? 
So, so we're just talking about sources, okay? So that was the, the previous one, input sources. Now we have good sources. How do we discover entities? So name entity recognition, again, if you have taken the NLP class, that will be uh, the technique that we can use to detect mentions of entities, and if so, we can assign those types. So if you have a, a document that says, you know, Bill, Glay, Bill Gates you know, donate you know, X amount of millions to you know, uh, help in the, in the design and implementation of a COVID vaccine, we would like to basically identify that piece of text that Bill Gates is an entity person. So we need to detect that. And, and how do we do that automatically? Uh, we're going to use basically some sort of an NLP toolkit. And you can use NLTK if you're using Python, Stanford Stanza, Gate. Those are like out of box toolkits that you're going to just basically run one of the methods and say, give me entities. And hopefully, Bill Gates is going to be tagged as person. Uh, if Bill Gates is not being tagged as a person, then you have to sometimes, you know, kind of retrain or input some extra data and so forth. But it's doable. Actually, it works pretty, pretty well out of the box. And we're going to get a lot of popular types, you know, people. So hopefully Bill Gates is going to be discovered. Um, Padua is going to be discovered as, as, a, as a city or location. Um, Stanford University is going to be discovered as an organization. Um, if you say, you know, October 27th is going to be discovered as a date. So that's pretty, pretty good. That's the basic thing that we can do. The second one is we need, if possible, to have some sort of a dictionary. And the dictionaries are going to be useful for detecting slightly dramatic <laughs> things that maybe the NERs are going to fail a little bit. One of the things is abbreviations. So we're talking about Apple, Apple Inc., Apple Computer. But if we're just, you know, tagging, you know, the Pam supermarket, it's just Apple the fruit. I don't want Apple Computer there. So we need some, some context. And also, we want to, you know, use this, hopefully, data to feed back into our NER. But in any case, we, if, say, we're identifying the, the computer company, we want to understand that Apple and Apple Inc. are basically the same. Think of Microsoft, Microsoft Corporation, Microsoft Corp, Microsoft Corp with all the dot. Actually, the same thing. Uh, acronyms MS, that will be Microsoft in the context of software. But if we find MS in the whole different domain, maybe it's not Microsoft. Careful. Uh, and also stage names, you know, Lady Gaga, but also, you know, Stefan Angelina Germanotta. Maybe if you say Stephanie Germanotta. S dot terminal, that you want all of them to say, hey, it's Lady Gaga, it's Lady Gaga, it's Lady Gaga. And finally, there's um, research on identifying particular patterns to identify entities. Um, those are known as the patterns by um, uh, Marty Hurst. Example would be like such as, or X like Y, X and another Y, X including Y. Those are kind of things that we've, we're going to try to find some potential entities. And by the way, I want to make this thing super complicated, but this is like how we are working this. Okay, so you have all these little nuances here and there. So that's the first part of the discovery. The second is we can use machine learning models. So here we'll be uh, using a CRF or uh, LSTM models. Very useful, we need to you know, provide some labels. So you're going to go to MTurk or, you know, you guys are going to do a lot of labeling. We're going to collect some data, you know, feed it into any of these uh, models, and hopefully uh, as output we'll get uh, our entities. Other things that we can do, which are super famous lately, are the notion of embeddings. So embeddings here is, uh, you know, going to use a, a pre-trained uh, embedding collection that is trained on a large corpora or large uh, text uh, database. And the idea is that words that are more or less semantically similar, they do happen because the context is similar. So we're gonna just basically work on that to identify uh, potential entities as well. And then other things that we can do is if you got a taxonomy from a catalog, or maybe we have works or user behavior, we can also you know, find some entities. Examples of that would be Wikipedia categories. 
So if you go to say Padua in Wikipedia, and let's assume they have a category that says Italian cities, hey, I'm, just, I'm gonna get the label Italian cities, and then I'm gonna get all the pages from that, and pretty good you know, list of Italian cities, assuming they're all correct. So that'll be one thing. The second is tagging systems. You are pretty familiar with Twitter, so you know, I hate my instructor, no, just kidding, but you probably use hashtag something, that'll be an example of just tagging annotating a tweet. The same with uh, Instagram and so forth. Um, maybe we're gonna use that, so that could be also useful. And finally, logs and clicks, you know, kind of the, the gold mine of everything. So that could be very, very useful to identify uh, potential entities. All right, so, so far we are only kind of discovering entities and now is, uh, okay, we need to link them. We need to make them a linkage. And the idea here is we need to recognize basically an entity mentioned in a piece of text, text being in a document, a tweet, a Facebook post, a query, whatever. And we want to, we want to link this entity to a corresponding entry in a knowledge graph, all right? Why? Because we need to understand that, you know, Bill Gates is a person, and although the article says Mr. Gates, or Bill Gates, or Williams, William H. Gates the third, you know, is actually the same entity. So that is this problem of entity linking. And this sentence here assumes we have a KG with existing entities. So we seem, we have to have a little bit of a data base here that contains all this information. Now, what is the difference between, you may say, uh, uh, an NER and an entity linker? So the NER is gonna recognize entities and is gonna assign an entity type, you know, Bill Gates uh, person. The entity linker is gonna recognize the entities in the piece of text and is gonna assign an entity ID. Remember that we have to have a unique way of identifying the entities, otherwise, Georgia is a country or is the name, we cannot afford to do that. We have to resolve the entity to one, you know, given the context. And for that, we have to also have a unique ID. And we're not gonna cover this today, not tomorrow, but this is kind of key. You have to have some sort of ID management system. Uh, a typical obvious example, village is, you know, automatically for every ID, uh, every entity that I discover, I'll just automatically generate a new number. But in practice, usually you're gonna use hash. So you have to, you know, again, have a, a, a good ID management system. And here's how this thing works uh, in practice. And apologize for the uh, American um, example, not, you know, culture, but this is what. So this is a, a real article. So Tom Brady to Tampa Bay Buccan uh, Buccaneers before the Super Bowl. And we want to basically we want to do entity linking. And what we want is we want to identify the entities and then we want to assign the proper one. So I'm gonna explain slowly, you know, what's the problem here. So we start reading from left to right. And we say, Tom Brady, okay, that's person. My database or my list of, of entities from my knowledge graph says, I have a player and I also have a guy that says Tom Brady, but he's a director. Okay, we got two. All right, what else you got? Keep reading. Uh, oh, I see Tampa. There's Tampa in Florida. There's Tampa in Kansas. All right, keep going. What else? Tampa Bay. It's a location. Hey, it looks like uh, for this team, the Buccaneer uh, in the uh, NFL, they, they're also called Tampa Bay. But also I see that um, if you're playing hockey, although the team is called the Tampa Bay Lightning, so call them Tampa Bay. And also, uh, if you're playing baseball, it's actually it's called Tampa Bay Rays, but they also call them Tampa Bay. Okay, we, we, we cannot resolve this yet, right? Um, and then we have Buccaneers. So if you say Tampa Bay Buccaneers, then we have, we, we can have success here uh, because we can say, oh, it might be are these guys. And then have Super Bowl but Super Bowl is every year. So there's Super Bowl 2021, 2020, and, and, and back. So all this example, 
to show you that this is not trivial. Okay, so I have to go to write, I have to ping my knowledge graph, I have to identify uh, a lot of things, and then with this context, with this context, I have to respond and say, Tom Brady is the guy who plays NFL, this is the team, and this is the latest Super Bowl. So that's what we want to get back. So we want to annotate three entities, Tampa Bay, uh, sorry, Tom Brady, people, organization, American football, event. That's what we're gonna, we're gonna do. All right, so how do we do this computationally? The first one is mention detection. So we need to identify uh, a piece of text snippet that can potentially be linked to uh, an entity. That's what we're doing here. So, you know, every time I was putting these red boxes, it's just basically looking through the, uh, through the mentions. And part of this is we're gonna use a dictionary. That's why we have, you know, hopefully a knowledge graph where it's gonna give us, you know, Tom Brady, the player, also Tom Brady, the director, and all these, you know, different things about Tampa. Then we are gonna have um, a lot of potential mentions, and then we have to, you know, select which are the ones that we really wanna use. We're gonna basically provide a rank list of candidate entities for each of these mentions. And then we're gonna try to disambiguate um, in context, assuming in this case we do have context because it's Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so then we can identify and hopefully disambiguate that is Tom Brady the guy who plays uh, American football, not the director. And again, we treat this as uh, a ranking problem and at the end we just provide the annotations. And when I say provide the annotations is here, this is the piece of text, but under the covers is semantically annotated. Does it make sense what I'm saying? You guys lost, you still follow me? I'm the guy talking about knowledge graphs. Just, you know, uh, 45 more minutes, five more minutes and uh, we're gonna break. All right, um, and then entity matching. So after the disambiguation and tagging and annotation, what we need to do is Okay, so we have to match an entity because this is gonna be for the query and this is gonna be also for uh, retrieval purposes. And to do this, we treat it as a, you know, kind of computing an equivalence class and also, you know, known as duplicate detection or rec record linkage. And there are many techniques we're gonna use for entity matching. One is name similarity. You know, you know the names are kind of very similar. That's straightforward to do. You can also use context similarity. Um, if we happen to have kind of more or less the same context, then I can see which of these entities actually are the same or not. Then I can play with, you know, basically mention entity popularity. So what is the, the most popular way of, of uh, referring to a person or entity? Um, this is an example of uh, a project and a, a nice paper at Microsoft called Nemo, Name Entities Made Obvious. And, and here the idea is that you know, the best evidence for entity disambiguation is basically the co-occurrences. So we're looking for co-occurrences as a signal to help us disambiguate entities. And the reason why we want to do this entity matching and disambiguation is, going back, is we want to tag the things properly. Okay, and if we have low confidence, guess what? We don't tag. This is kind of like closer to the spell checker, right? So if you're not closer to you know, give, give you the proper rewrite for Lufthansa, we're not gonna you know, try to correct your, your query. So we don't wanna hurt the yes. And finally, um, data, uh, the, the curation of all these data. So, oh, sorry. There's one more thing. Attributes and relationships. Sorry, I was just talking about um, uh, extraction of entities. Then we talk about the, the, the uh, linking. We talk about entity disambiguation. The other, p the other bit of entities is to identify attributes and relationships. This is kind of straightforward. We can use uh, you know, regular experience or rule based to identify some of those you know, attributes and relationships. How can we get this from content? Uh, well, we're gonna look DOM trees. So assuming we're crawling the web, we're gonna look at the <laughs> data object model of how the page was created, and it's basically leverage the structure of the page 
to identify certain attributes and relationships. Other things that we can do is to look at table. Tables are pretty good, right? Because the tables we said, you know, what is the starting lineup for Juventus? You know, player, you know, obviously this, I don't, you know, Piro doesn't play anymore, but you know, plays, you know, he's a, a, a forward, a defender, the goalkeeper, etc. Information is crucial. It's pretty good, right? But we need to crawl that from a web table. You can do the same for a Wikipedia page. We'll have all these tables. We have to crawl. Assuming that information is correct, it's pretty cool. And we're going to use, obviously, a lot of information extraction techniques, which is we're going to parse the page, identify the entities, try to get the context, and then try to guess a piece of text that we believe will be pretty, pretty cool. This is cool if you have things like info boxes for Wikipedia. You just go to the info box of Padua and you know the Latlock, uh, the original name, the uh, population, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't have those info boxes, if you want to do the same for the prosciutto in Pound, well, we're in trouble because we don't have the info box for, for that. So complicated. Um, KG curation, as you can see, we've been talking mostly about uh, uh, algorithmic approaches to this uh, piece of information. But in a lot of cases, we need some sort of human power here. One is to assess the quality of what we get. So this is going to be standard precision recall metrics that we can compute. Crowdsourcing, which the idea here is just build a, a solution where we, we have human in the loop. So as part of this computation, we have someone who is going to say, yeah, this is good, or if not, it's going to say, actually, it was traded the player, not the director, and then we can learn that uh, in the loop. And last but not least, we have two more pieces. This one is the life cycle of the graph, um, and this involves prominence about the metadata, so we want to know all the sources. We talk about the input sources. We want to know when did we ingest this data set, um, what was the extraction method that we used to uh, get all this information into our, our graph, and also versioning. We want to timestamp the graph. We'll be going back to this item uh, tomorrow because uh, at the end of the day, we have to maintain this data set. This is, we're, you're never done building a knowledge graph. You're always building a knowledge graph. And I added uh, this architecture because so far you can say this guy is absolutely mental. The only thing he does is just takes up, you know, knowledge and gives a lot of examples. How the entire thing fits together. So here's uh, an architecture of one of the cages that I work on. How does it fit? How, how is everything going on here? So on the left side, you have n number of sources. So we have source one, source two, source three. And sources, imagine, <clears throat> you know, the web, the catalogs, the query logs, whatever. You're going to run basically a name entity extractor and an information extraction component. Just extract the entities that it can. Assuming we have DP, DBpedia, which is a dump of Wikipedia entities, uh, let's say that also internally we have people who are going to help us identify the entities. Okay, these are just the input sources. We're going to get all these different signals and we're going to run like a, a big union or a big fusion scheme. Okay, so we're going to try to, you know, unify all the sources. To do that, we need two crucial pieces. We need an ontology. Okay, so someone says this is the world of music or medicine or food or whatever. So someone has to have this kind of ontology structure. And then we're going to run a lot of entity resolutions to understand that, you know, Bill Gates and William Gates are the same person, that in this context, Georgia and this other Georgia are not the same. We need that kind of entity resolution. We're going to run a step of basically data cleaning. And data cleaning here is we're going to, we're going to keep the things that we think is of high quality, stuff that was kind of sketchy, we're not going to uh, add it to our graph or just clean as much as we can. After that, we're going to run probably uh, oops, uh, 
um, a quality assurance component where we want to make sure that this thing is correct. Like if the pathway is a city in Italy and then my nose graph is like pathway is a city in Germany, it's like okay, we might have a problem here. This is not correct. And this piece is important because we're going to run many versions of the graph. So you never want to decrease the quality of the graph, right? So, uh, you know, John Lennon used to play for the Beatles. That's a fact. You cannot say, well, the previous version say that John Lennon plays for the Beatles, but, you know, the new version said that John Lennon is the lead singer for the Beatles. Like, well, that's actually not true. So that cannot be the case. And that's why we want to have all these, you know, quality assurance uh, components. Then we, we publish a new version of the graph. That's KG. There's going to be a human curation here to just, you know, fix a few things on the, on the graph if we're not super happy. Um, we're going to build a specific user interface and browsing feature for the knowledge graph. We're going to, you know, materialize uh, an index on it. So we're going to publish a few things here and then we're going to build an API so you can access the graph. This is one. This is not the only way of building a knowledge graph. There are many ways of building the graph. But this is one architecture that kind of works reasonably well. But you're saying that is, that is all good, but uh, how do we use this guy? OK, so how can we use this guy? OK, where is the KG? So in the context, and this is just in the context of information retrieval, you know, we have uh, a query. So I want to go to, um, I'm going to actually probe the, the, uh, the audience. Can someone share a query that you issued today in Google? Not personal, any query that you shared today in Google. In Google, DuckDuckGo, whatever. Anybody wants to share that? They're only studying, so nobody's searching, which is not true. Okay, so. I search with this probability space. Sorry? I search with this probability space. You search with probability space? Yes. Okay. Uh, doesn't have a lot of entities. Any any query on that contains an entity that you've done today, if you remember? Okay, I'm going to use the same. Um, Places to go in Lake Garda, okay? So that's my query, places to go in Lake Garda. Then uh, the, query, the query processor is gonna normalize and segment places to go in Lake Garda. Segmentation, normalization, because Lake Garda is how I see it, probably for you is Lago di Garda, okay? So all those kind of normalizations is gonna happen here. Then it's gonna annotate so it's going to say Lake Garda location, or Lago di Garda location. That is station. And then it's going to rewrite the query to the actual uh, internals for the search engine. So maybe it's just the query places to go in Lake Garda or places to go in Lake Garda. It's actually the same thing, guys. Just, just see what you got. Uh, this goes into um, the retrieval and ranking piece. It's going to, you know, issue everything that you've done since, um, you know, building the vertical index file and so forth. It's going to retrieve information based on some of the entities that we may have from the knowledge graph. It's going to show me the SERP. This means search engine result page. It's basically how you build the, the page of, of the results. In all these pieces, you're actually pinging the knowledge graph, okay? So it's like, what is Lake Garda? Uh, is that a, the real name? Is that the canonical name? Is, can, can I expand? Are, do people uh, use two different names to actually mean the same Lake Garda? Uh, if we happen to have entity, how does it rank in my rank of entities and so forth? So we're going to be using the KG pretty much everywhere. Okay. So previously, this is how we build the data. This is just like, let's just build KG as a data. That's all. Okay. No search. Nobody cares about question answering, information retrieval. We're just building data. That's all. Here is 
In the case of we're building a search engine, we like to use the data that we just created. This is how can we use it? Is the only a scenario? No, this is just one search. There are many other applications. This is one of them. Some scenarios. The, firm, the first one is uh, search. So we want to augment the search. So if I say, you know, places to go in Lake Garda, and if I happen to know that Lago di Garda is also the same thing, I'm going to augment, you know, hopefully say, oh, it's a nice location. Here's an image. We can do in summer or in winter. That's good. Query understanding. We kind of cover already this. Oops. And then user intent. So they, you know, places or things to do or, or where to go in Lake Garda then is uh, the intent is there's an entity and then the intent is things to do around the lake. So that will be like what the engine needs to solve. That's for search. For ads, oops, sorry, will be uh, can we bid on the queries, uh, sorry, on the nodes and relationships. So if I say I have a node that says Lake Garda is a location in Italy, then say, you know, I run a little uh, shop that sells you tours in Italy. If you say things you do need, I'll say, show Lake Garda. Okay, places to go skiing or not Lake Garda. Places to go swimming, Lake Garda. That's pretty cool, right? So I can, I can pick up on that. Uh, other things here would be competitors for a pasta brand. So, you know, I have Barilla and I have Colavita who will sell olive oil, at least in the US uh, or other pieces. I can show you competing, you know, products. And then recommendations. So I can recommend, you know, products and recipes to users in the case of food here. But if, you know, we're looking for things to do in Lake Garda, then what are the kind of activities that I can, that I can do? If I happen to store activities in summer, winter, and, you know, fall and spring, if I have a clock or some sort of understanding temporally of where you are, then I can do that as well. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, goes too fast. Recommendation is about uh, also, and I mistype uh, uh, words and uh, for example, Google uh, uh, alerts me that I type the wrong or uh, Good only- Good observation. So in the case of, of that is if I mistype Lake Garda here, for example, if I, if I can predict that actually you were trying to to type Lago di Garda, say that I say Lago with two Gs, you can say it's Lago di Garda, man, just don't type two Gs, right? So uh, that would be the spell checker. What I meant here is this is mostly about recommending products or recipes or, or links or other things. So more like a standard recommender system. But you can use that also to recommend the correct spelling, which is what you said. Did I answer your question? Yeah. So that would be uh, one scenario. Second scenario would be, for example, recommendations um, uh, in a shopping list. So say that, you know, here's the user. Uh, you know, the user is, you know, I'm going to Pam, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, in Pam online, and I'm just like, I need spaghetti. Um, I need Parmesan cheese. I need olive oil. And maybe Pam says, hey, looks like I'm going to cook spaghetti carbonara. How about if I just basically fill your cart with everything? You don't have to keep searching, I'll just fill your cart. Or maybe you are trying to you know, cook this alternative, I can also fill your cart. That would be a cool you know, application of using the graph. Another example would be question answering. And the idea on question answer is I wanna issue a query in natural language and we wanna have a, a, proper, a proper answer. Here is if I say that the cheesecake you know, contains eggs, so if I issue the query, you know, does cheesecake have eggs, then you can say, yes, it does. Okay? So I just use the triples that, that I have on, on, the, on the data. Looking at my time. All right, so notice graph for IR summary. Um, we can tag, hopefully, um, documents with entities. And if I do that, then I can do better document retrieval because I know that the document is maybe about an entity, about a location in more detail, I can do that. If I do that, the second bullet is entity retrieval. 
Um, if I happen to have you know, a good knowledge graph of, of entities, then I can rank them properly and then I can reference that to a query if I happen to have that. Entity recommendation, given a query queue, we're gonna rank the, uh, each entity that belongs to the knowledge graph based on their relatedness to the query. And other things that I haven't talked, which is the explanation of the relationships. So if I happen to have you know, entity relationships, then I can explain the relationship by using the things that are basically the edges or the nodes. That could be a cool application. Now, if I wanna do this for AIR, so it's like, okay, I buy you, I, I really like all these examples, how do I make it happen? So what we need to do is we need to represent the entities in some sort of schema. Because so far, when we build a search engine, we have web pages or documents, we convert an index, we issue a query, you ping the index, and based on that, we use VM25 or whatever is your favorite ranking model, and we show the result. That is cool. But entities per se, you know, it's not a document, it's just, it's Lake Garda, it's Bill Gates. You know, it's just an entity, don't have a document. So how, how can we basically, you know, get something out of it? Um, so a technique for doing this is called predicate folding. And the idea is we're gonna basically just look at all the triples about a particular entity or relationship or type or whatever. Um, we're gonna artificially build a virtual document, right? Uh, we're gonna do basically field retrieval in that document. That sounds super complicated, but it's not. used to have an example, and is this one. So this is basically predicate folding. So let's just assume that we have collected all this beautiful information about spaghetti carbonara, right? So it's a recipe, you know, spaghetti carbonara is an ingredient, obviously, needs spaghetti, needs pancetta, needs eggs, and needs Parmesan, and the recipe cuisine is Italian, and this particular recipe, for example, serves four people, is uh, 5, 10 calories and takes 25 minutes to cook. This is everything that we know about um, spaghetti carbonara. So if we fold, if we fold, here is name spaghetti carbonara. Let's show the ingredients, okay? The ingredients is measure like a field and then the ingredients are spaghetti, pancetta, eggs, parmesan. Other attributes that you guys have? Yes, it's Italian cuisine, serves for, these are the calories, and the cooking time is 25 minutes. And because assume I have this bunch of other entities, I can say it's related to spaghetti aglio di olio, excuse my pronunciation, and fettuccine alfred. Now that I have this, then I, you can imagine I'm gonna index this document. If I'm gonna index this document, then I can do all the tricks that you're in my art. So I can say, hey, you know, do you, uh, do you have eggs in spaghetti carbonara? Yes, I just do a, a search within ingredients and then I return results, right? And then I can find related entities, I can run your recommender system and so forth. And how do I do that? It's basically entity retrieval. And for doing that, we're gonna use field search. So just to go back a little bit. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Imagine a document and then we index per field. So this is uh, an index on name, an index on ingredient, an index on attribute, index on related entities. And then when I search, I basically look for a match in my field. So if I have X, I'm gonna say, do you have X in field one? Do you have X in field two? Do you have X in field N? Each of them we can use some sort of weight and at the end we return a score. And, and by the way, uh, this is just a standard linear combination. And because these are weights, you can use learning to rank to learn the appropriate weight and so forth. Obviously, this is a little bit simplified. There's many papers on how to do uh, folding from super simple things to some complicated uh, methods to do folding. But conceptually, this is it. You just take um, all the triples, you just fold them basically, and they ran some uh, standard uh, index technology on that, and you get your results. Cool. So if you can do that, then 
we have basic information retrieval using entities. Um, because I have this, then I can take advantage and then uh, I can also tag my documents. Okay, so now I understand that spaghetti carbonara is a recipe. So if I index spaghetti carbonara from the web, I'm gonna say, this is a recipe, man. I'm just gonna tag the documents. I'm gonna can clean my, my catalogs and so forth. Um, I can do the same with query annotations. Now that we say spaghetti bolognese, I can say, that's a recipe. Place to go to Lake Garda. That's a place in Italy. Um, because of that, I can also uh, run query expansions. So I have um, a knowledge graph now that is indexed, and then I can relate it, I can get entities. In this case, will be, say that I issue the query uh, spaghetti carbonara, and for some reason, I didn't get a lot of stuff. I can say, well, you know, if I have something on Fettuccine Alfredo, it's gonna be close enough. So even if I say, I don't get anything from spaghetti carbonara, but I have documents, Fettuccine Alfredo, it's pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable, right? Versus showing you stuff from Lake Garda has nothing to do with spaghetti carbonara. And going back to semantic search, then we can, we can do better understanding of the information needs. Um, I can do query classification. So I can assign my query to one of um, many of the categories that I have. In the case of Lake Garda, that will be the, the location of the classification of the query is location. It's pretty clear, right? If I say spaghetti carbonara, the classification is recipe or food. And uh, query annotations, that will be uh, the markup for a query, uh, segmentation in groups and phrases, and then I can do query tagging, speech, NER, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the cool things that you know, we know how to do that. Now, a bit of problems here when we're doing entity linking in queries. So, so far, we're talking entity linking on just the, the, the piece of text, but if I wanna do this on, on queries, um, the queries are very short. So if you say Tom Bray, I say Buccaneers, if I say Juve, Juventus, you know, not a lot of text. So sometimes I don't have context or no context at all and I have to resolve the best way possible. And you have to do this within milli, milliseconds. So I don't have a lot of time to, to explore and expand on the query. And it's gonna be somewhat similar. So I have to look at dimension detection. I have to, you know, rank my candidates and then have many interpretations of the query. Then I have to pick the one that is mostly probable. So what I'm talking here in case you're lost, so this is entity linking, the same thing that we do for Tom Brady and the Buccaneers, but instead of tagging the document, we're tagging the query, okay? And the problem is in queries, I have way less text than I have on documents. So I don't have a lot of room. And how can we use entities for search? Query assistant on the autocomplete, uh, entity cards, which I already mentioned, and then recommending entities, um, based, uh, entity recommendation based on the entities or the queries, and also we can do this for, for explanation. I already covered entity cards in, in detail, so I'm not gonna talk about them again. All right, Jean Maria said 10 more minutes, so 2.10, so I'm gonna use 10 minutes to show you uh, an application. The first one is called a social knowledge graph. So this is a uh, past project at Microsoft, plenty of papers. Um, you're all familiar with Twitter, right? So the project is very, very simple. So we're gonna basically drink Twitter data and then we're gonna output the graph. So we read Twitter and the output is basically four type of nodes, topics, entities, links, this over time. Why we start this project? Because drinking from the high fire hose, fire hose is basically you know, the Twitter stream, is very, very hard. Uh, there's very low level at the atomic tweet, so a tweet has very low level, but there's a lot of value if you wanna build things on top in terms of aggregations. And by the way, the method here works for you know, LinkedIn or Facebook for any social network. Next. Okay. 
All right, so the input is a purifier host, the output is a knowledge graph, four main components, links, topics, entity, four organization, places, and, and time. And we're gonna look at uh, the graph from those views, but the focus is on super high quality content. So what do I mean by this? Uh, the first one is content from the, from the links, and then we'll talk about content from people. So we're gonna use a machine learning classifier to tell us if the tweet is good or not. So imagine that you have a tweet that says, I'm tired, very, you know, not very useful, but you can say, I just spent time in this museum and part of a link to the museum, that should be more useful. Uh, we can also do this for detecting spam. So we're gonna remove everything that is spammy. We're gonna normalize all the links. So we have people putting a bit.ly, uh, sharing the official link, sharing a link with different parameters. So we're gonna uh, normalize all those links. We're gonna dedupe all the links using minhash. It's just deduping on the links and then every other metadata extraction that we can get from the Twitter cards, um, open graph metadata, et cetera, just to classify those links. All right, so content selection, part one. Um, and the, the, the idea is we want to get like this. So I have, for example, a link A that says, you know, piece of text about, you know, ISIS, text, 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 then the link, another B, another you know, explanation of a link. And then for each link, so we have link A, we're gonna extract engrams. So in this case, the link is about Islamic State, about rules, etc. The hashtags for link A are gonna be ISIS, ICE, uh, ISL, DASH. And then for each of hashtag, each hashtag, we're gonna associate other links as well. So just basically extracting info from link, I can go to you know, the engrams from the hashtags, I can go back to the links or topical description. This is gonna sound crazy, but just uh, bear with me for a sec. This will be another example of, say, hashtag Paris attack. Um, you know, the title of the, uh, the article is Paris terrorist attacks from CNN. That's the article. You know, David Cameron, these are, you know, 7,000 moderate fighters in Syria. This is the link. And then what we want is we want to extract the summary. A summary, kind of a, a list of engrams associated with the link. Uh, and also hashtags. And then for each hashtag, we just, you know, detect even more. Straightforward. That's the content. The second will be on, on users. So you identify this thing called verified user, that's manual. So Twitter will manually check that you're verified. This was done in 2014, so a lot of time ago. But uh, we came up basically with an algorithm that will scale trusted users. And we call it trusted because we start with um, an original uh, account and then we're gonna go through what we call, you know, number of degrees. So for example, say that um, the official account from Microsoft that is verified, okay, and you know, a verified user is, is going to, uh, for example, add and initiate kind of a, a conversation with an unverified. In this case, this was, you know, Dick Costolo, which is one of the CEO, actually, this is a mistake, not a founder, CEO of, of uh, Twitter by that time. Uh, if he kind of responds back to Microsoft, then he's trusted. So the analogy will be Bill Gates, verified. He, you know, adds me in Twitter and then I reply back, then I'm trusted. Because Bill Gates knows me, I know him, then I'm trusted. And then I go into different scale, uh, different degrees, and so then I scale. So automatically, we can go and from a small subset of trusted users, we can go to 17 million users within a few hours. Boom, you know, very data set. So now we have good links, we have good topics, sorry, we got good uh, users, and we're gonna, uh, extract basically metadata about the links. So I'm gonna show you already the engrams and hashtags that I can extract. Now we're gonna look at basically popularity and, and virality. So how are those links going into the social graph? Either it's a little retweet or resharing, etc., etc. That'll be an indication that those links are useful. So I wanna kind of piggyback on that. Um, Okay, and there's filtering, but that was good links detections. 
And then this is our schema, and then two more slides and then I'm done, uh, where we basically build something simple of kind of, you know, four main tables. You have the users, everything about the user, everything about the link, everything about the topic, and then we're gonna basically add what we call provenance or supporting evidence. A few tweets that will support some topics that are being discovered, uh, so being talked in, in this, uh, in this uh, schema. So that is users, links, topics, and posts. This is standard information that you can get from Twitter, okay? But then, here is the, there's no RDF here. We'll be talking about this uh, tomorrow, but this is mostly key values. So here what we want is connections. I want to go from users to topic. Okay, I want to go from what are the topics to Bill Gates. Uh, from users to links, what are the links that Bill Gates share? Uh, from users to users, use, you know, Bill Gates connected with me. Uh, links to topics, given CNN.com, which are the topics that you know, CNN.com talks about? Topics to topics, you know, politics, you know, Democratic Convention, hashtag politics, Republican Convention, that will be a topic to topic. And then the last one is users to post. I want to see all examples of the post for me. I want to see the topics and so forth. So slice and, and dice from any, any different directions that you can imagine. And then we, you know, provide a few more examples of things that are trending for hashtags and this with the goal, and I'm on time, to basically build what we call the Social Knowledge Graph Explorer. So in the case of Brexit, so this is the topic, Brexit, hashtag Brexit, is related entities, in this case when Brexit happened, was United Kingdom, European Union, Theresa May. Related hashtags, hashtag EU, hashtag stop Brexit. Why it's called a social knowledge graph explorer? Because you can derive these things automatically. Okay, so which is basically read Twitter data, we build all these relationships automatically. So then if you had a question, if you got a query stop Brexit, I can get stuff from, you know, May or UK or EU. If that day I issue the query EU, I know it's about you know the Brexit event. And here we have the notes and relationships. These are supporting evidence of why certain things occurred together or why this particular day the topic was heavily discussed. All right. We made it to the end, friends. And tomorrow we have another session with about uh, 50 slides more or less, we'll, uh, I'll be talking about an application on top of the graph, this is just a browser on the graph, tomorrow we'll talk about one application of this graph, then I'll be talking about a brand product graph, also from Microsoft, then something based on healthcare, and then kind of a summary and, and uh, what to do if you want to have, you know, uh, different uh, architectural design decisions for building a graph. Thank you so much for the attention, and I know that I, I speed up a lot, but I, hopefully you got some of the, uh, the concepts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's see you tomorrow. And all the papers that Omar mentioned just below that, you can find them on actually, but uh, maybe probably we are going to put them in the Moodle page so, can, you can, so that you can download them, read them, and see if you're interested. In particular, well, many things that we did in our course, as you for sure noticed. And uh, about predicate building, um, Dennis is here. We worked on something very similar for his PhD uh, thesis on a chapter. So if you are interested in that particular stuff, we have ideas that we still have to develop so we can discuss that for a thesis or something. That's a topic we are still interested in specifically. A lot of other stuff, but that one just fired me a trigger that is something that we might want to discuss. If you're interested in the conjunction between graph databases, RDF, and information retrieval. Okay? See you tomorrow. Thank you.